I'm delighted to represent our speaker for this morning, Dr. Harold Atkins. Dr. Atkins is a hematologist with the Ottawa Hospital Blood and, Blood and Marrow Transplant Program, an associate professor of medicine at the University of Ottawa, and a scientist in the Center for Innovative Cancer Research at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. He received his undergraduate and medical degrees from the University of Ottawa, and following internal medicine training at the University of Ottawa, he completed clinical and research fellowships in hematology, stem cell transplantation, and experimental hematology at the University of Washington and at the Ontario Cancer Institute. Dr. Atkins specializes in the clinical care of patients undergoing blood stem cell transplantation and has spearheaded the use of stem cell transplantation for immune repair to treat patients with severe autoimmune diseases of the nervous system. For this work, he was awarded the OHRI's Dr. Michelle Kretchen Researcher of the Year in, two, in 2016 and the Till and McCullough Award from the Stem Cell Network in 2017. He has run a clinical trial exploring the role of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in preventing organ transplant rejection and is a member of the BioCan RX Chimeric Antigen Receptor Cell Therapy Program, which is developing gene modified immune cells to treat blood cancer. If this, uh, this bio is familiar to you, um, it is because Dr. Atkins tried to give us this presentation in July, and unfortunately our connection was lost. Uh, I believe he went on to give the whole presentation uh, before realizing that the audience was disconnected. Um, so he has been uh, very um, generous to represent this to us and uh, we've triple checked to make sure the connection is working well. So Dr. Atkins, we are very much looking forward to this presentation. Um, the title of the presentation is Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplantation and the Lung. Welcome Dr. Atkins, over to you. Thank, thank you very much. And um, I appreciate that everybody is patient enough to listen to the beginning of my talk again. And um, I hope it isn't too repetitive and um, that we can get to the part where, where you haven't heard before. So I'm going to talk today about um, hematopoietic stem cell transplant. The first part of my, my talk is going to be a little bit about um, the um, uh, what a, a stem cell transplant is and what we use it for. And then I'm going to uh, focus on some of the complications and uh, particularly those of the, the lung. And, um, and can everybody see my slides now? Okay, good. So we use hematopoietic stem cell transplant for a, um, a, a number of different diseases. So in the adult population, most of what we, we do is stem cell transplants for um, treating malignant diseases, uh, leukemias, lymphomas, myelomas, and uh, uh, the occasional germ cell or testicular cancer. Um, but in other settings, uh, gene, um, Stem cell transplant has been used to, uh, as a, an early form of gene therapy, for instance, replacing a missing gene product uh, in Gaucher's disease or some of the uh, storage diseases or in um, um, immunodeficiencies where there are a genetic basis to them. But it's also a cell replacement therapy. And, and so um, we can uh, remove um, cells um, that are producing blood cells with defective uh, gene products like in thalassemia or sickle cell anemia and replace the marrow with a, a normal um, a stem cell, which will then uh, um, fix the genetic deficiency. And, um, and uh, we can also replace hematopoietic stem cells that have been killed by immunologic methods like an aplastic anemia or from radiation accidents. And thus, um, while most of the transplants are, are done for malignancy, they're quite versatile and, and uh, find there are new biologies being explored that allow us to use these treatments for quite a few other kinds of diseases. There's age differences. And so, as I mentioned, um, this is data from the uh, stem cell therapeutics Outcomes Data Registry in the United States. Uh, this records the uh, outcomes of all allogeneic transplants, 
And if you look at um, of the data that they had from 2006, almost all the adult transplants are done for hematological malignancies. But in children and young adults, um, there are a fair number of, of transplants that are done for inherited or immune-mediated diseases. What is a transplant? And I'm going to get uh, Bart and Lisa to help me here a little bit. So it, it involves selecting a donor. The donor may be someone related or unrelated to the patient, or it may be the patient itself. We collect stem cells from the patient. And um, we have uh, version one here where we used to take the patient to the operating room, put them to sleep and um, using a, a needle with a, uh, um, a, a trocar um, in it, we would place this in the posterior iliac crest of the patient on both sides of, usually we're doing this in parallel, um, removes the trocar and and suck out about uh, 10 cc's or 20 cc's of marrow, which we then hand off and collect in a bag. This whole procedure is designed to collect about three quarters to one liter of bone marrow from a, a normal size adult. And, um, and uh, we can use this marrow rich product to uh, engraft people. Um, version two, so, so patients didn't really like going to the operating room and and besides the pain it's the uh, side effects of of anesthesia which which bothered patients the most and so we came up with technology version two and this uses um, an agent to mobilize stem cells from the patient's bone marrow into their circulation where um, uh, we can then use a apheresis procedure to draw off the white cell prot fraction of the blood, and which is enriched in stem cells and use this as a, a, a means of engrafting people. And then finally, new technology developed a, about 15 years ago where we would collect cord blood from a, a recently delivered placentas and this uh, provides enough hematopoietic stem cells to, to um, uh, engraft a, in a small child, for instance, or a, um, a, a, a small um, teenager. Once we have the, the stem cells in hand, we can do a couple things. We can cryopreserve it, we can select it, we can process it. And we have a, a variety of new tools available for doing these things. Um, so for instance, if we do an autologous collection and we need to wait for the patient to recover from the chemotherapy, we cryopreserve the stem cell graft in liquid nitrogen. For, um, if, um, for what I do, uh, using stem cells transplants for autoimmune diseases, we don't want to reintroduce potentially auto-reactive lymphocytes back into the patient. And so we can use immunomagnetic selection um, on a, a, a clinical scale machine to um, purify the stem cells. And what we do is we incubate the graft product with um, an antibody, a monoclonal antibody that is tagged with uh, an iron filing. The antibody recognizes the stem cells selectively and so once the, uh, the stem cells have bound the antibody, we pass the whole mixture through a, a column, which is um, filled with steel wool in a, a magnetic field. The stem cells are delayed. The rest of the cells, the non-stem cells, the immune cells and everything are washed through. We discard those and we change the container we collect in and release the magnetic field and the hematopoietic stem cells will flow out. And do, doing this procedure, we can purify cells um, by about a 10,000 fold. The new version of this machine is called a Prodigy. It has the capacity to do everything that the uh, a Clinimax can do, but we can also um, modify cells. And so we can select cells, we can selectively culture the cells and, and grow some cells. 
we can do gene transduction on here. And, and so this is the machine right now that we would use to do CAR T cell production. Um, and we have a protocol for that at, at our hospital. And, um, and in the future, I think this machine is going to be able to gene modify cells, for instance, to treat thalassemia or sickle cell patients or, or um, skid patients. Once we've decided how the graft is processed and we have it stored away, we can go back and um, treat the recipient with a conditioning regimen. The conditioning regimen has um, several functions. It kills cancer cells, if that's our, our therapeutic goal. It can ablate the immune system so that we don't get rejection of the marrow or that we treat the immune, uh, an autoimmune disease and it creates space in the marrow for the new stem cells to engraft. The following conditioning, the uh, stem cell graft is infused, and then we provide supportive care to treat the complications of the conditioning regimen and to monitor for graft-versus-host disease. There are several important um, parameters in, in understanding the outcome of of a stem cell transplant. So one is how we select the donor. And as I said, we can take autologous stem cells from the patient. We can take uh, stem cells from a related donor, which is either HLA matched, potentially HLA mismatched, or potentially HLA half matched, like from a, a parent to a child or from a child to a parent. And fortunately, we have uh, uh, access to um, probably uh, 10 million or 12 million unrelated donors around the world who want to volunteer uh, to donate uh, stem cells. And, um, and so we can search these to look for HLA matched or HLA one antigen mismatched uh, donors that could be used for a, a donor type of transplant. There are pros and cons of, of these donor selections, allogeneic transplants may be associated with graft versus host disease, which would be bad. You have the risk of transmission from of, of infectious diseases from the donor to the recipient. But autologous transplants might be, um, the grafts might be contaminated with tumors or have a predisposing gene mutation that, uh, uh, you know, if there's a familial predisposition or a um, uh, inherited pre-cancer there that um, might lead to um, re re repeated uh, relapse of the disease. The allogeneic effect may be uh, detrimental, causing uh, graft-versus-host disease, which can cause morbidity and mortality, but it's associated with a reduction in the relapse rate, shown here if we have no graft versus host disease, the relapse rate uh, following transplant is about 30%. If they have acute or chronic graft versus host or both, the relapse rate goes down to uh, somewhere around uh, 10%. And depending on how severe the graft versus host disease uh, is, um, there may be a survival benefit for having a little bit of graft versus host disease because we're more likely to have a graft versus tumor effect. The other parameter is, is the kind of uh, conditioning regimen we have. And there's a relationship between dose intensity, shown here on one axis, and both the efficacy, the depth and duration of cytopenias, the amount of stem cell depletion, the amount of immune depletion, and the intensity and frequency of off-target toxicity that we see. And so we have to judge how dose intense we want um, the conditioning regimen to be to balance out these positive and negative outcomes of transplant. And that allows us to really customize a, a transplant. And so we may have uh, uh, do myeloablative allogeneic transplants where we get cytokilling from the cytotoxic agents we use. We get immune mediated killing of a cancer, for instance, from the allograft. Sometimes in older people where we want, um, they're frail and may not tolerate high dose chemotherapy, we can reduce the intensity of the 
chemotherapy, but still rely on the immune-mediated medi killing. And in the opposite situation, we may have an autologous graft where we don't need this immune-mediated killing or the risk of graft-versus-host disease, and we can just rely on the effects of the conditioning regimen. The morbidity is related to uh, patient transplant and disease. And so the patient, if there's an uh, increase in comorbidities, that might be uh, big underlying respiratory diseases, uh, neurologic diseases, uh, uh, depression, uh, uh, autoimmune diseases. They're at, those patients are at higher risk of developing a complication from the transplant itself and may have poorer outcomes. Similarly, the disease will mandate how intense our chemotherapy needs to be, and that will ultimately influence the number of side effects that the patient has. And then the transplant, um, depending on uh, what kind of donor we have and how well, if it's an, an allogeneic donor, how well the match is may uh, impact the outcome of disease. The, these diseases. And so uh, just two examples here. One is uh, using contrasting a myeloablative to a non-myeloablative transplant. And I've given two examples here on the bottom. In the non-myeloablative situation, they may have very uh, short-term neutropenia and um, a, a risk recovery with um, not uh, a very long period of neutropenia these patients may not even lose their hair. And so the, the chemotoxicity is much less and we're relying on an immunotherapy effect. In a myeloablative transplant, well, we might get much more severe uh, neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, and we have to provide more supportive cares for the tissue damage that um, will happen. And here, just to contrast, uh, our choice between an autologous and an allogeneic transplant and, um, and what happens to the long-term outcome. So, so in patients that die, depending on how you selected your, your donor, you may have different reasons for failure. Autologous transplants mainly fail because the primary disease relapses. Allogeneic transplants may fail because of relapse of the primary disease but be more often because of a graft versus host disease infection and organ failure. Okay, some of the complications and getting to the pulmonary aspects of it. So one of the complications is actually um, damage to, to the endothelium and the liver. We call this sinusoidal obstruction syndrome nowadays, but it used to be called um, uh, venoclusive disease of the liver. This is a triad of, of weight gain, anasarca, and painful enlargement of the liver. If um, the disease gets worse, it progresses, the patient will become jaundiced and develop ascites, and then go into renal, cardiac, and pulmonary failure. And this typically occurs early after the transplant and, and uh, usually within the first three weeks although there are some, some late forms of this disease. And so if uh, the patient goes into pulmonary failure, a uh, respirologist might be asked to come in and help guide um, uh, the care of these patients. And, and not so much um, that it's a, uh, a, a um, their management is, is required, but to make sure that there isn't another cause of of um, pulmonary failure that's occurring in the patient, that it truly is due to this SOS. There are risk factors that we can identify beforehand, um, but we're actually short on treatment. So the most severe forms of treatment can be treated with a defibrotide. This is a oligodeoxyribonucleotide product that's made from pig intestines that um, acts somehow as an antithrombotic agent that um, ameliorates uh, the graft, um, the venoclusive disease. Um, and so often we try to prevent the disease rather than treat it. 
um, by looking for risk factors for, for venoocclusive disease and, and trying to mitigate them before the patient goes to, to transplant. Graft versus host disease is another major complication we see uh, after allogeneic stem cell transplant. There are really two forms of uh, graft versus host disease, acute and chronic. And um, um, I wanted to just show you a little bit to contrast the two forms. So acute graft versus host disease is a, an inflammatory process. It causes a uh, marked uh, inflammation of the skin. Here's a mild to moderate form. In the severe forms, it will, will actually cause desquamation. Um, the graft versus host disease can affect the skin, uh, uh, acute, the skin, the liver, and the um, bowel. And so these patients may get quite jaundiced. They may get a profuse a diarrhea and have nutritional complications on top of that and may have these uh, skin rashes. But uh, occasionally they get uh, acute pulmonary graft versus host disease. And while this is rare, it tends to um, occur a little bit later in the period, towards three, four months, and may again present with inflammatory changes as cysts or nodules. And again, um, sorting that out from infectious causes or, or other causes might uh, would definitely lead to the need for having a uh, respirologist involved in um, helping sort this out in, in our, our patients. Um, chronic graft versus host disease, on the other hand, is more of a fibrotic reaction. And the skin here in a, a patient you can see is not uh, really inflamed, it's hyperpigmented. And you, it's hard to, to see in a photograph, but the texture of the skin isn't proper. And it's almost as if these people have uh, early scleroderma with the thickening of the skin and, and maybe necrosis of the subdermal um, tissues. It can lead to uh, fibrosis across joints and they get joint uh, limitations of, of motion and joint contractures. Um, and it can cause um, pulmonary chronic graft versus host disease, which usually presents as, as a bronchiolitis obliterans or an organizing pneumonia or fibrosis, and I've given a, a fairly typical x-ray of a, of a patient here, and, and they may go on as the scarring process proceeds to um, get traction bronchiectasis and then recurrent infections on, on top of, of the damage done by the fibrosis. The treatment of graft versus host disease is to suppress the donor immune system that's causing this in the patient. We um, have good evidence for the use of corticosteroids in acute graft versus host disease as the first line treatment. However, if this fails, um, there are no well established second line therapies, and almost every treatment is. Um, then based on uh, cohort studies rather than a, a well-proven, uh, strong, randomized clinical trials. Almost all immunosuppressive agents have worked and many of them have some benefit in uh, some patients. Tanercept may help patients with graft-versus-host disease of the bowel, but tacrolimus, a cyclosporin, imuran, um, anti-thymocyclobulin antibodies, uh, alemtuzumab, bertuxin, now um, ibrutinib, the, the uh, uh, BTK inhibitor, JAK2 inhibitors such as ruxolotinib have, have been tried and, and all of these drugs have some benefit in some patients. There's another kind of, of uh, process we can do called um, uh, photophoresis. Um, again, it's an apheresis pro pro um, procedure where blood is taken from the patient, uh, loaded, the blood cells are loaded with the dye. Um, the dye, dye loaded blood cells are exposed to UV irradiation here, which somehow alters the 
um, lymphocytes and puts them into a tolerogenic mode. And then these are infused back into the patient. And this would be done you know, quite frequently, six or seven times a month for the first month, and then uh, spread out as the patient's graft versus host disease comes under control. There are many early complications of graft versus host disease. And so to sort out um, these myriad of complications often is, is complicated. Um, we may get uh, heart damage and get cardiogenic pulmonary edema from some of our chemotherapy agents, particularly high dose cyclophosphamide. Um, VOD may cause non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And Grafman syndrome may come around the time of the um, neutrophils returning. This is probably because of subclinical viral or infections in the lung or other infectious agents in the lung that have not been able to be cleared. They've been able to be controlled by antibiotics. Uh, with the neutrophils, they return into the lung and cause uh, pulmonary um, uh, infiltrates and fevers. Um, because the platelets are low, our patients can get diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Um, some of the drugs can cause lung injury, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, there are idiopathic syndromes, the graft versus host disease we talked about, and, and of course, infections, which in the early period after transplant may be bacterial, um, they may be uh, fungal uh, when the patients. Um, um, going through in the first three months. Uh, they may reactivate cytomegalovirus. Uh, this usually occurs after engraftment, but so sort of between 30 and 100 days after the transplant. And um, allogeneic patients would be prone to pneumocystis, pneumocystis infections because of um, impaired T cell function. Non-infectious lung injuries occur in 25 to 50% of all hematopoietic stem cell recipients. And, um, and it's not unusual on our ward to have people in pulmonary edema. We give lots of fluids. We kind of, they get infections. They have uh, a subclinical um, depression of their heart function. They may have a hemorrhage and they may get some of these other um, more um, immunologically or infectious mediated lung syndromes. Alveolar hemorrhage occurs in about uh, 10 or 15% of allogeneic tra and autologous transplant recipients. It's rare that they have hemoptysis, but the hemoptysis is, or sorry, the blood is, is often found in the bronchial tree. And it's often in conjunction with other illnesses. And so the patient may have an acute deterioration, end up in the ICU, may have a fever at the same time. They're started on antibiotics, the bronch is done, and there's evidence of blood as well as um, uh, infection. And the, with him, uh, a diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, there's a very high mortality, as you can uh, as sense from um, the concurrent illnesses that these patients have, that uh, they're, they're often extremely ill. There can be idiopathic syndromes where uh, the patients get fever, cough, and shortness of breath, usually around the time of engraftment. Um, and uh, there are diagnostic criteria for this. And it's really a, um, um, a uh, diagnosis of exclusion where there's no infectious etiology found. You can't find heart dysfunction. We've stopped loading the patient with fluid and their kidneys are functioning normally. And uh, some of the uh, interleukin-1 or interleukin-6 um, um, inhibitors uh, may help in this situation. Chemotherapy itself can, can um, uh, damage the lung and the he, um, or the, the most common um, agent is busulfan. We use busulfan in, I would say, about a third to a half of all our, our transplants. 
and uh, fortunately the lung damage is rare, but um, it, it's not rare enough that it would prevent um, Bollywood from making a movie about a young girl that had um, busulfanol, and this is based on a, a, a true story. The busulfanol uh, appears as a interstitial uh, chronic fibrosis most often, um, uh, but it can be complicated by acute uh, forms and uh, hemorrhage. And um, usually what happens is that this is slowly progressive and results in a deterioration in the respiratory status. And it's important to rule out other causes because we're going to treat this with steroids, which has uh, empirical evidence that this will work. Um, and so you don't want to make sure that these patients don't have an infection at that time. We can grade the pneumonitis and, and again, um, we worry about the more severe forms um, because they will ultimately keep progressing and uh, are poorly responsive to treatment. While busulfan is the most common drug that can cause this, other drugs that we use and radiation therapy can also cause interstitial fibrosis in our patients. And, and so um, it's not just asking if the patient's been on busulfan, you have to know what they've been treated with to, to know if it's a drug associated with um, the IPF. There are also uh, late complications of hematopoietic stem cell transplants. As we talked about, the chronic graft versus host disease can occur and cause uh, bronchiolitis obliterans or uh, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. But you can also get uh, post-transplant lymphoproliferative diseases from reactivation of EPV, which can cause lung damage, or a lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia um, from a, an immune-mediated process. There are ways of de de deciding whether it's more likely to be bronchiolitis or obliterans or cryptogenic pneumonia. Um, these occur in different context, the, um, um, and so graft versus host disease, more likely to cause boop uh, and um, um, occur after 100 days, more associated with a shortness of breath uh, and uh, bronchial tree involvement with different patterns on the pulmonary function test and a bit different appearance on um, uh, imaging. And there will be a, a, a marked difference in the appearance of the cells that are, are pulled out on BAL. And so BAL is, it, in addition to the CT thorax, is a useful modality for helping differentiate between these, these two um, different syndromes. Uh, the last part I want to talk about is infections. Um, and so, uh, Patients go through different periods of, of defects in their immune system after their transplant. So for the first two or three weeks, they're neutropenic, lymphopenic, and hypogamma globulinemic. But after uh, engraftment, the neutropenia resolves. They remain lymphopenic for a variable amount of time, depending on the type of transplant they've had. Uh, and even if they're not lymphopenic, uh, allo transplants, for instance, would be on immunosuppressive drugs and their lymphocytes would not work. And the hypogamma globulinemia, patients are usually reconstituting their B cells around um, six to eight weeks after the transplant. And so the, new, the hypogamma globulinemia will, will resolve shortly thereafter. But uh, because the T cells don't work, the B cells don't work. And, and so it may take a while for patients, even after an autologous transplant, to reconstitute normal immunity. And so they're at, long, at risk for various uh, pathogens during these diff different periods. They also have other risk factors. They've broken down the mucosal barriers early on, and so they're at risk for bacterial invasion. They have central lines and uh, 
catheters, and so they have uh, access to the vascular um, um, route of infection. They may get acute or chronic graft versus host disease, which are immune suppressive in their own right. What we've seen is, is that we can really understand the kinds of pathogens that occur in, in these different periods. So early on, we may get uh, HSV infections. And so our patients are on prophylactic uh, antivirals. Canada's uh, a common uh, uh, occurrence early on. It's usually mucocutaneous. So people are on um, uh, prophylactic fluconazole. Aspergillus may occur in patients that have had long uh, periods of neutropenia before, like the leukemia patients, and they may need um, a treatment with uh, not just fluconazole, but something with broader antifungal coverage like posaconazole. We see bacterial infections early on, line infections over the, the next period. And then um, once new the neutrophils have recurred, well, we get a different spectrum of disease. CMV reactivations may occur, shingles may occur. And so again, the antiviral prophylaxis has to continue on. We do monitoring for CMV reactivation uh, routinely and early treatment if we see evidence of a viremia developing. Um, if, and, and so, knowing where the patient is will help guide what kind of pneumonia, for instance, you might uh, need to be treating. CMV pneumonia is, is unfortunately not much of a problem anymore because of uh, screening and early intervention. Um, the, um, this was an um, important cause of death as transplants was, were starting in, in the 70s and 80s would result in deaths in, uh, with a case fatality rate of over 50%. Now with, again, cyclovir, we can prevent this. And I have to say, I haven't seen a case of CMV pneumonia um, probably in the last 20 years. And, and so, um, but it needs to be thought of. And when you have a patient with pneumonia, definitely, uh, with a bronchoscopy need to send away testing to determine if they have CMV reactivation or not. The other kinds of viruses that uh, affect our unit are the um, seasonal respiratory viruses. Influenza has been a, a big issue, parainfluenza, uh, rhinovirus, coronaviruses. This was even non-COVID coronaviruses and human metanumoviruses. And, and so there are particular seasons where we screen our patients to, to see, make sure that they don't have one of these uh, viruses before starting. We have a surveillance in our ward to try to prevent um, outbreaks. If um, there is an outbreak, we limit visitors, patients go into isolation and um, uh, to try to prevent them from the, the virus is from spreading through the unit. Um, and, and again, every once in a while, we would have a patient with influenza. So we have a, a low threshold for starting um, uh, Tamiflu in patients with um, respiratory symptoms that are not yet diagnosed until such time as we've ruled out influenza in these patients. Um, and, and while for most of the population, these viruses are inconvenient, um, in acute transplant patients, those that are in the hospital for their admission, there is quite a high mortality, even with the most benign of, of these viruses, like rhinovirus, for, for instance. And as I mentioned, we we have a variety of, of um, uh, preventative measures and we're strong believers in vaccines where those are available to try to prevent uh, the spread through the unit. Um, we are very strong supporters of having the staff immunized, for instance, in uh, the flu season, 
family members of patients immunized with a uh, flu vaccine. And uh, um, we vaccinate anybody who's um, more than three months after their transplant when the flu vaccine becomes available in the, um, in the, in the fall. Finally, I just want to uh, talk about the approach to infectious lung complications because um, uh, it, it, respirology plays a very important role in helping us understand what's going on. Um, we have available um, non-invasive tests, cultures for pathogens, swabs for viruses, a chest x-ray, CT scan. Um, but if and, and we often start empiric broad spectrum antibiotics or, or antifungals or antivirals as, as the need may be in our patients. But early on, we would like to have a, a more certainty about what's going on. And so high resolution CT scan and bronchoscopy are, are very important tools to help sort out patients with respiratory complications after stem cell transplant. And in um, the EBMT handbook and uh, studies of the use of bronchoscopy, bronchoscopy will lead to a diagnosis in 78% of cases in where it's been studied. And um, the risk of complications is fairly low. And doing the bronchoscopy early rather than late is an important um, um, way to improve the diagnostic yield. Sometimes we see um, a little bit of nihilism in, um, a bronchos in the approach to bronchoscopy in our patients. And yet, um, I, I think knowing what is going on in our patient and sorting through these myriad of, of potential complications that our patients may have help us direct treatment and, and um, sort out whether we should immunosuppress the patient more, whether we have to treat a specific pathogen. Um, is it a common pathogen that we're already treating? Is it a rare pathogen where, where we have to change treatment? And so um, I, I just, uh, respirologists are good partners uh, when you're a transplant physician uh, to help come up with uh, answers to patients who are are usually quite sick by the time we, we um, see them. Uh, this is my last slide. I just want to make a plug for the EBMT handbook. If you have questions about hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, this book is um, a short book uh, with chapters about all the different problems or approaches um, that are three to five pages long. It's um, available at this website. You can download the PDF for free, and it provides an excellent reference for approach to problems, and it will point you to, to uh, more in-depth reading if you, you're interested or need to. Uh, I think that's it. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Atkins. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, we, uh, we stayed connected with you uh, actually and uh, <laughs> cognitively. So uh, thank you very much for that. And now before I turn it over to questions, um, you've, you've left us with a, a good, good time for questions. Before I turn it over, I neglected to mention at the beginning that uh, in addition to all of Dr. Atkins' clinical and research work, He's also been a member of the board of directors of the CHORI, and I understand has made some very important contributions um, provided very helpful advice over the years. So thank you also on behalf of uh, CHEO and the CHORI uh, investigators for all of your contributions there as well. So thank I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to turn it over to questions. We have um, uh, quite a large audience today, um, and uh, you've attracted. Um, members from a number of different areas. So I'm going to turn it over and I'm going to be looking for uh, hands up or uh, and then we, we will unmute you. Hi Mona, it's Jason. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you Jason. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thanks Harry very much for that phenomenal um, uh, overview. Um, I think you made a complex area very accessible to uh, this broad audience and I want to echo uh, 
uh, Mona's thanks for your contributions on the RI board. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about that, that you didn't discuss as much is the growing trend for haplo uh, transplants, uh, which has expanded the donor pool for uh, many patients, uh, certainly in pediatrics, but I think in, 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 in uh, adult populations as well, who are more limited with uh, donor availability. And I wonder if you could talk about uh, current trends in haplotransplantation. Yes, thank you, Jason. Um, uh, thank you for joining as, as well. Um, and, and so we do have new technology. Um, prior to about a decade ago, it was, was um, understood that the more mismatches you had in the histocompatibility antigens between the donor and the recipient, um, the more likely you were to get graft versus host disease and not the mild form of graft versus host disease, but the fatal form of graft versus host disease. Um, and, and about a decade ago, a new technology came up along where we would, um, uh, so, so how this actually works is that you have a, a patient who's haploidentical, like a parent into a, a, sorry, a child into a parent or, or a half match sibling, and the uh, cells are put into the patient the, uh, without immune suppression at the beginning. This allows the lymphocytes, the donor lymphocytes, to start reacting against the patient's uh, body. And about three days after um, the infusion of the graft, we kill those, lymph the, those proliferating lymphocytes with. A, a dose or two of cyclophosphamide, and then resume normal immune suppression in the patient. And this has allowed us to um, um, uh, uh, breach this HLA barrier that we've been facing over the years that would limit us to the number of donors that we have available. It turns out in certain situations and for certain diseases, the haplotransplant data is actually looking better than, than some of the HLA match data for um, preventing graft versus host disease. And so this technology of using cyclophosphamide to kill the proliferating immune cells afterwards is being extended to um, uh, the HLA match setting, the unrelated donor setting, and it may allow us again to use um, donors that are not as HLA matched um, and thus opening avenues of transplant for many, many patients that we don't already have. The, the trend is to use this kind of technology um, to increase donor pool, but there's pros and cons to that because again, um, you may find donors for frail people, the frail patients may not be able to, to um, uh, tolerate the high doses of chemotherapy that we use. Um, and there are um, uh, uh, unusual complications sometimes like uh, um, uh, cytokine release syndromes that have been seen in these haplotransplants. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Um, next question is from uh, Johannes Roth from Rheumatology. Go ahead, Johannes. Yeah, hi, thank you very much for an excellent talk, uh, Harry. I have a question about um, scleroderma and I think you have quite, uh, quite extensive experience with uh, scleroderma and the issue in these patients, I think that often leads them also to transplant is uh, lung involvement. And um, I was wondering, how you deal with that situation where a lung is always already been damaged, it's already compromised, and then you do a transplant where you actually risk a significant reaction to the lung. Yeah, um, so, so we've done about um, 25 or so transplants for scleroderma over the last, mainly over the last few years. And um, some of those patients have had quite remarkable um, lung disease already. Um, you know, the DLCO is in the 30 kind of percent predicted range. Um, and they, they are 
the, the scleroderma patients are a challenge all around, not just from the pulmonary point of view. Um, but we try to optimize their disease um, uh, beforehand, either you know using um, steroids sometimes um, in a moderate dose, carefully watching for renal crisis, or um, uh, you know keeping them on uh, mycophenolate as long as we can to get them to the point where they can actually have enough performance um, that they can tolerate the stresses of transplant. We modify our procedure. Um, so again, almost every transplant patient gets flooded with fluid during their, their stay. And it took a little bit of, of um, observation to realize that the scleroderma patients don't tolerate that and we're very uh, stingy with fluids in uh, both our conditioning regimens and ongoing, carefully watching the weight to make sure the patients are not accumulating fluid. And uh, that seems to help the patients. Um, and, and what's been surprising is, is that uh, probably after the skin, the lungs are the organ that improves the most. And um, I've had several patients go from being on the verge of, of needing oxygen um, to, to um, you know, getting back to normal life, normal activity. Um, it doesn't happen all the time, but enough of the time to, to make you optimistic about this kind of therapy. Johannes, do you have a follow-up question or comment? I, I would if there is time and if there's nobody else who has a question right now. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, so the other question is maybe a little bit more difficult to answer, but um, one of our patients from CHEO is undergoing transplant right now at SickKids um, and she has had an unfortunate complication of her systemic joint arthritis, which is a, a unique form of pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. And the reason she went for transplant is that everything else failed and, um, and really her lung disease was progressive, but it was already quite bad. And so not unexpectedly, um, she did probably have quite a significant engraftment syndrome and the graft went in and went straight to the lung, of course, that was already damaged. And she's being treated for that right now. And issues such as you have mentioned with fluid overload have been issues also in her case. Um, so my question is with regards to the fibrosis that you described with ongoing uh, graft versus host disease in the lung, is there a, a kind of a time frame or is, are there any indicators um, that you would uh, be able to watch to say, okay, now we're getting into unfortunately a fibrotic phase because I mean, that's a real risk in that patient also, of course. That, uh, yeah. yeah, we don't really have predictive tests. Um, um, all our, our, you know, you follow the patient and you see that they're starting to get short of breath or you do routine chest x-rays and you see the fibrosis in the aloe setting. Um, there, there are, um, and, and, you know, that's a, a lot of transplant. You, you kind of start and you know what's going to happen and you try to mitigate as much as you can, but you can't, you don't have an absolute for a predictive test for, for each complication for, for each patient. Uh, presumably she, she had a, an auto transplant, not an allo transplant, so no, she unlikely. Had, she had an allo transplant because uh, there is a uh, potentially a genetic mutation contributing mm -hmm. to her disease, so. Okay, yeah, so, so that gets, gets hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this is an unusual situation because, uh, you know, it was really a decision whether to try a last pitch or go palliative with her. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of an unusual situation, but I was just curious about this transition from the more acute graft versus host um, event to the uh, fibrotic phase. And, and any role for antifibrotic agents in, in, in your patients? To like that? Yeah, I, I don't know of any data that's shown that they work successfully. 
Um, and again, it's it's because of the drive of, of the immune system that's causing the fibrosis is, is pretty strong. Um, the, um, it, the fibrosis that occurs for graft versus host disease tends to be insidious as well. And so it doesn't happen within the first couple months. It tends to occur a little bit later, uh, four, five, six months. And, and it kind of just starts very, very slowly and, and, um, and, and just is, is very progressive in, in my experience. I hope, hope she doesn't get that. No, neither do I. I. I guess it's a matter of controlling the, the process of the, the craft versus host disease at this yeah. point. Thank you yeah. for that answer. Dr. Atkins, I wonder if you can leave us with um, some final comments about um, uh, stem cell transplantation in the lung in the pediatric population specifically. I can't give you profound thoughts because I'm an adult transplant physician and um, probably haven't seen a, a pediatric transplant for many years. Mm -hmm. um, but there are, um, um, it, it's, it's a burgeoning field. And I think in terms of using stem cell transplant to fix immunodeficiencies, uh, genetic diseases, it's a, a, a powerful tool. Um, and and um, um, I think you're going to see more, more treatments become available, particularly as we're able to gene modify um, autologous transplants mm -hmm. um, to, to, to fix some of these problems. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, thank you very much on behalf of the uh, audience. Uh, we really appreciate uh, all your, um, uh, your great um, uh, comments and presentation, uh, and uh, we look forward to the future in this field. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, and thank you for listening, and I'm glad we stayed connected this time uh, for the whole thing. <laughs>